you've got your handout with you this morning, go ahead and get that out. I always try to put a few scriptures and outline notes in the handout that you can follow along with and look at together with me and study on your own. Think about. As I was thinking about this week uh, and thinking about what to share, um, one of the things that occurred to me is we seldom talk about what Jesus did during the 40 days between the resurrection and his ascension. He had 40 days that he hung around on the planet before he went to heaven and um, before the Holy Spirit really took over in the body of Christ and the church. So I wanted to look for a few minutes at some of the things, I'm looking at five things that Jesus did during his earthly state after the resurrection. And maybe learn from that the, important, the importance Jesus placed on these few items. Because it wasn't a long time. I mean, what if you knew you only had 40 days? If you knew you only had a short period of time, what would you do differently? How would you spend your time? In fact, that's the thing to think about. How did Jesus spend his time, and are we spending our time in like manner? Are we spending our time in the same kinds of ways, doing the same kinds of things that Jesus did during that season of his life? So I really call this post-resurrection hope. (laughs) I mean, there's the hope in the resurrection, but think for a few minutes with me as we do dive in here uh, what Jesus did and how he did it and how that might influence us. First thing I want you to note, and jot this down if you would, Jesus showed up. Jesus <laughs> showed up. And that is the post-resurrection appearances. That is what took place, and he came to be seen. He came to be known. You know, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, someone texted me that not too long ago. Was that you, Marietta? (laughs) It says, they took note that the apostles had been with Jesus. Jesus' relationship with the apostles was imprinted on them because he spent time with them. He showed up. Now, we've just gone through this series, this season of time where showing up was not allowed. Huh? Showing up for worship for a season was not allowed. Two years ago, we couldn't gather for an Easter worship service. Even a year ago, we were having struggles, trying to meet outside instead of inside and etc. No? And we couldn't always show. In fact, people are just now starting to get back to showing up for work. Have you heard people talk about that? They've been uh, remotely doing their work and now companies, state offices are saying, no, it's time to show up. (laughs) What did Jesus do? He showed up. Boom, boom, boom. Ten different times he expressed himself in love for his disciples by just showing up. Now, they didn't always recognize him well. It took them a, a little bit of time to notice and sense who Jesus was and what he was about, but he showed up. It startled them at times. I heard this week about a lady. She was down in Beverly Hills watching, you know, seeing some of the uh, movie stars. And she was in a, like an ice cream parlor. And this movie star came in that she was so excited to see. And she rushed out and, you know, kind of was taking a picture of the place and the movie star. And then she looked around and she couldn't find her ice cream cone. So she went back in to find her ice cream cone, and the celebrity said, "Uh, Ma'am, look in your purse. (laughs) In all the excitement, (laughs) she had tossed her cone in her purse. And it sounds like the disciples were like that. When they were so excited, they acted in unusual and weird ways a lot of times. Like, who is this? What did Jesus do, though? He just calmed their fears. 
When the disciples were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and they talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. And I just want to encourage you in that phrase for a minute or two. Jesus shows up. Jesus isn't looking for perfect people. He joins us where we're at. He's not looking for sinlessness. He's looking to forgive our sins. He's not looking for people who have it all together and are walking f- five feet over the ground. He's looking for people with skin on, who are in the game, even though they were kept from recognizing him. Later, they marveled. Later, they said, weren't our hearts burning within us as we talked with him? See, Jesus spent 40 days on earth after his resurrection. During this time, he eased his followers' doubts. He gave them direction. He didn't shout his love from above I love you. Now, the father shouted his love to the son and said, this is my beloved son. But Jesus was the one who was touched down. He was on the earth. He showed his love on the earth. He showed his love to his people. Today, he comes the same, bending down low to hear our cries, to heal our hearts. We live in that in-between stage where We're not, like Jesus was a heavenly being, but he was also an earthling. And as he was an earthling, he showed his love. And eventually the Holy Spirit showed that. Author uh, Henry Bosch made this observation. He said, Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato for 50, Aristotle for 40 but Jesus only for three. Yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years of teaching from the other men who were among the greatest philosophers in all antiquity. Jesus painted no pictures, yet some of the finest paintings of Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci received their inspiration from him. Jesus wrote no poetry, but Dante, Milton, and scores of the world's greatest poets were inspired by him. Jesus composed no music. Still Hayden, Handel, Beethoven, and Bach, Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection of melody in their hymns, symphonies, and oratories that composed in the praise of his name. Every sphere of human greatness has been enriched by this humble carpenter of Nazareth who never went more than 100 miles from his home, who never was held any political office, and yet there's been no person on the earth who influenced more and gave us more of himself than Jesus the Christ. Jesus showed up, and he continues to show up in our lives through the Holy Spirit, through his leadership there. Let me uh, shift to a second one here. Jesus demonstrated, he modeled community. What did he do during those 40 days? (laughs) Some things you would be surprised. He cooked breakfast for his disciples and invited them to sit down and have a meal. He appeared in the middle of a locked room and broke bread with his disciples. He was promoting, he was encouraging, and continuing what he had started. Community. He modeled community. Now, there are 10 different appearances of Jesus that are described and talked about, and then several others that are just cursory lists that he met with. He met over 500 people at one time after he was resurrected. But um, Jesus built community in unusual ways. For instance, who are the first appearances to in the New Testament after the resurrection? To women. 
women who were, at least in their culture and society at the time, not even able to be a witness in court. But Jesus didn't care. He valued and held up the value of every individual, regardless of gender, regardless of economic status, regardless of any social uh, function that people had. He said to the women, go tell the men. You be the witnesses. Tell them. The group of women that came to the tomb to anoint the body. And then this passage we spent some time with last week, the two apostles, the two um, disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. Jesus spends time. They they say, well, well, we're going to go on. Jesus says, I'm going to go on. And they say, no, stay with us. What does Jesus do? He takes them up on their invitation. He stays with them. He builds community. And it was through that process that they recognized who he was and and began to celebrate. They ran back to Jerusalem to tell the other 10 apostles, the other 10 disciples, what had happened and that Jesus was indeed resurrected. When he met with the disciples behind locked doors, what was he trying to do? Not only show himself to them, but to build community. When he dealt with Thomas, when he reinstated Peter, when he gave the Great Commission, all of these appearances, he's building and building and building community. When he goes to the seashore and he says, let down your net on the other side, and the disciples are remembering, oh, we've been through this drill before. And the nets end up catching 153 large fish. Wouldn't that be fun, Larry? Yeah. <laughs> So much so that the nets weren't broken, which was a miracle in itself, but gave Peter and the disciples an understanding, this is the risen Lord. Let's have breakfast. Let's break bread. And he took time for that. Some people criticized Jesus for taking time in those 40 days to do something so menial as to cook fish and break bread. But that was part of building community. Let me encourage you in your building of community. Eat together. At one time we had uh, 12 home groups kind of functioning out of the body here. And at one time it went down to about three. Now it's kind of in the growing phase again. And uh, I see the groups that do what Jesus did, eat meals together together, build community, spend big blocks of time together, I see those groups thriving because Jesus gave the principle, spend time together. In our busy world and in our world based on fear that says, oh no, we might have a disease, we might get sick, we might press against the, the, the society, the culture, and spend time together. It's not a mistake that he said, where two or more are gathered, there am I in your midst. It wasn't a mistake when he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Assembling yourselves together. Get together. Now, you're the folks that are here today, and I want to encourage you in that, but it's not just a Sunday morning opportunity. It's not just worshiping together. In Jesus' time, it wasn't just at the temple. It was in homes. It was regularly. You know, if you think about it, it wasn't Jesus' appearances where people recognized him. It was in his behavior. It was in watching him break bread. It was in watching what he did. Not the appearance of Jesus, but instead when he called out and he said, Mary, and she recognized his, his call to her. It's after time. It's in the midst of of that time, when he, um, when the miracle of the fish took place, when the teaching along the shore took place, it was part of what he did was to build community. Jesus serves the meal, and he builds the community with the folks. So what is he up to? He's preparing, you know, he's serving, and he's nurturing. 
No, I think that's the call he has for all of us as we gather. Prepare yourselves. Jesus prepared a variety of things, including fish and bread. Are you prepared? Is it scheduled? Is it timed out? Serving. You know, it shouldn't be that the body of Christ has a lack of servant hearts. We ought to be jumping at the opportunity to serve, to serve the body of Christ, to serve young ones, to serve needy ones, to serve the elderly, to serve those that are hurting, and then nurturing. Maybe God's given you a gift to be a teacher, to be a leader. You know, that's what Jesus did in building community. He was nurturing them. And he told Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Just like I've fed you fish and bread, I want you to feed my disciples. Feed and lead. Let's do the third one. Jesus comforted the broken. So while this 40-day period was taking place, and people were brokenhearted, people were upset. He ministered to them. He comforted. When Jesus came back, he wasn't frustrated that his disciples hadn't understood his plan. Instead, he met them in their uncertainty. He met them in their fear instead. Even though his body was so different, Jesus comforted the broken. Brothers and sisters, isn't that our challenge today? People all around us are broken. They're brokenhearted. They're broken-spirited. They're broken, and he wants us to come alongside, to follow his plan, and to comfort those that are broken. Jesus reassured Mary. Jesus reassured Mary at the tomb. When he called out to her, look at what it says. Woman, why are you crying? Well, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Isn't that interesting? It happens so often. Who is it that you're looking for? Why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I can get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them um, that he had said these things to her. Listen to that encouragement. Don't hold on to me, but tell them I am ascending to the Father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. She didn't, he didn't berate her for her lack of faith or lack of understanding or even her perception of who he was. Instead, he built into her encouragement. He reassured Mary Magdalene at the tomb and said, don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. I've got encouragement instead for you. Jesus reassured Mary at the tomb. Jesus eased Thomas's doubts. Now, <laughs> there were places in Thomas's life where we wouldn't have called him Doubting Thomas. We would have called him Thomas the Brave. In John chapter 11, where Jesus is saying, I'm going to go down here and there's going to be persecution involved Thomas jumps up and he says, well, let's go give our lives then. He was kind of on the brave side, not the doubting side. You know, there were a couple of times like that. But in this case, Thomas was not with the other disciples when Jesus appeared. And so he doubted to a point where he said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand, unless I place my finger, my hand in the spear marks in his side, I'm not going to believe He was doubting at that time. So wouldn't you think Jesus would be really upset with him? 
No. What did Jesus do when he saw Thomas? He said, Thomas, I'm here. I'm showing up. We talked about that a minute ago. But I'm here to give you the evidence, to show you the reason to believe and to not doubt any longer, to trust me in the midst of this. And he said, put your finger here. See my hand? So he was willing to supply the evidential level that Thomas needed. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord, my God. Some things we can learn right from this spot here. Um, We're pretty complex people. (laughs) Thomas was a very complex person. He was brave one minute and he was doubting another. By the way, does that sound like us? We are very complex spiritually, physically, in every way. Yep. And Jesus takes us right where we're at. He took Thomas right where he was at. On one minute, calming him down from being so brave. And the next minute, lifting him up so he wouldn't doubt. We are very complex. We are very distinct. Um, Number two, Jesus cares about our problems. He cares about our doubts. He cares about our questions. Jesus didn't just gloss over and go past them. Jesus, I mentioned this earlier, says that community matters. He showed up so that Thomas could believe. And he shows up so that we can believe. I think we learned from this too that um, Jesus says, it's okay. You can bow down and worship me as God because... I am. Now, this is a good spot to pause and to think about. People say Jesus was just a good moral teacher. If people say Jesus was just a prophet, then you have to come to grips with this scripture because Thomas bowed down in worship and declared Jesus to be Lord and God. If Jesus was not Lord and God... He's a liar. He's not a prophet. He's not just a good man. He can't be a good man and allow someone to bow down and worship him if he's not Lord and God. But because he was, he allowed it. So that stands for us. We can't allow people in our culture, people in our society, people who are to say, well, I believe in Jesus. He was a good man. No, he's not just a good man. He is the son of of the living God. He is God of God. He is Lord of Lords. So as we, like Thomas, bow down, we're not just saying he's a good man or a good prophet. He had some good moral teaching. We're identifying with Thomas and saying he is indeed. And that's the level that Jesus comes to with all of us. He wants to put into our hearts and birth in us this belief, this trust that he is who he said he was. He provided evidence to believe. Jesus has a message for us, for all of us. Psalm 43 says it this way, or 34, excuse me. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears him. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is the time in Jesus' life when he's coming to those who are crushed. He's coming to those who doubt. He's coming to those that are brokenhearted, and he's blessing them. He's taking time to minister to them. Jesus comforted the broken. Oh, brothers and sisters, if we become like Jesus, comforting the broken in our community, there is no end to the opportunities that are ours because everywhere we turn, people need the love of Christ. Everywhere we turn, people need to be lifted up in their brokenness. One more thing I want to point out. (laughs) Jesus brings life and peace. A word of life and peace for the disciples. 
And they said, we're not our hearts burning within us? What did Jesus do while he walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus? We talked about this last week. What did he do? He spent time opening the scriptures to them. He went through the entirety of the Old Testament and showed them verse by verse, phrase by phrase, how he fulfilled the scriptures, how he fulfilled the word of God to them. That's what Jesus did in speaking words of life to the, to the disciples, speaking words of peace. They got so excited when he showed them the connection between himself and the Old Testament. They got up and returned to Jerusalem at once. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It's true! The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Remember I said he showed up? (laughs) Here he is. He showed up in the midst of a locked room. In the midst of a, a fearful situation, he showed up and what did he say? Peace be to you. Now, this isn't just a peace that's the absence of war. This is a deep seated, abiding peace. Peace. It's a peace with power, not a peace with the uh, absence of, of warfare. It's a peace with power. He says, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they'd seen a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Even here, he's willing to come to the level where they're at and just say, don't be afraid. Why are you so troubled? Like he said earlier in uh, John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. He threw encouragement in every situation, said don't let your hearts be be troubled. By the way, today, if you've come here today with a troubled heart, with a broken heart, with a serious need, Jesus is planning and wants to meet that need. He wants to meet it directly with the Holy Spirit, and he wants to meet it through the body of Christ. Just like the body of Jesus appeared in that room, he wants us to appear and to suddenly and amazingly and miraculously begin to minister to one another and to say, don't be afraid. Trust in God. Don't be afraid. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith and hope in him. Here he said, it is I myself. Touch me and see. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? We often think seeing is believing. And he said to Thomas, blessed are you that you see and believe. More blessed are those. He was talking about us who not seeing believe, who even when you don't see, have a heart for Christ and believe. Here he said, put your faith, put your hope, put your trust in God as you have seen. I have. So Jesus took time. He took time to bless the broken, whether it was Thomas with his doubts, Mary with her questions, needing reassurance, or the disciples needing life and peace. He declared it to them. What if we, as the body of Christ, spend our time doing the same thing Jesus spent his time doing? Speaking to people, life. Teaching people the scriptures. Spending time with people, giving them the peace that passes understanding. That's his his plan. That's his need. That's why he's called us to be his disciples One more thing before we go to this uh, instruction and empowerment. Jesus uh, redeems the fallen. So he actually enters into those who've let him down and ministers to him. The biggest example of that is Peter. Peter, this bold leader for the kingdom of God who shrank back, who denied Jesus how many times? Not once, not twice, but three different times. Someone would say, which was worse, Judas's betrayal or Peter's denial? Or Thomas's doubting? They're in the same boat. And all can be forgiven 
illustrated by Jesus in his redeeming of Peter on the shore. When the miracle of the fish took place and Peter ran to the, to the fire and began having breakfast with Jesus, what was the uh, conversation that Jesus had with Peter? He asked him some questions. Peter, do you love me? In some ways it says, do you love me more than these? And you're not sure. Does he mean more than these other disciples? Yeah. Or does he mean, do you love me more than these, the fish? We don't really know exactly what he's referring to, but he says, do you love me more than these? It could just be the world. Do you love me more than the things of this world? Peter's response, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Jesus doesn't stop there. He asks him again, Peter, do you love me? Peter, three times, you go, wait a minute. Peter denied Jesus three times? <laughs> Jesus asked him to affirm three times. One time he says, I love you like a brother. And Jesus says, do you really? Jesus asked him, do you love me with a godly love? He says, well, I love you like a brother. Finally, Jesus says, do you really love me like a brother? <laughs> do you really love me like a brother? And gives him a chance to affirm his relationship. I call it redeeming the fallen. Because Peter had let down Jesus. In fact, he let him down so much that when he denied him, his uh, Lord the third time, he ran out in tears. He went away bawling. He was crying because of the let down. No? That ever happened to you and me? Do we ever get discouraged because of our own letting God down? He wants you to hear. He wants you to hear clearly today that you cannot be outside of his scope of redemption. He will restore you if you just allow him to. <laughs> in our cancel culture, you know, he doesn't cancel anybody. You know, Peter should have been canceled, right? Like someone who'd put on blackface 20 years ago, and they should be canceled and extricated out of our culture, you know? Or people in, in today's world that just get canceled. Jesus is not about canceling anybody. Jesus is about affirming, reaffirming, and redeeming us. No matter what mistakes you've made in the past, no matter how you've treated Christ in the past, today's a new day and he's calling on you and he's calling on me to trust him anew, to ask, answer that question, do you love me? Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you love God for providing our Savior, our Lord, our Master, Jesus People are so afraid today. I think it was a week, couple weeks ago, we had a Supreme Court nominee who wouldn't define the word woman because she was afraid she'd get canceled, no matter what she said. Kind of go, what kind of a society are we leaning toward? Where are we getting to? Where does cancel culture ever end? No, it doesn't. God's calling us to have exactly the opposite, a reaffirming culture. The body of Christ should be a redeeming body, should be a place where we affirm and reaffirm one another, regardless of what we've been through, regardless of even where we stand. You know, Jesus encourages us, feed my sheep. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Oh, brothers and sisters, he's calling on you and he's calling on me to show our love for him by investing in the family of God, by investing in the body of Christ. Here he says, my sheep. Just like I fed you bread and fish this morning, Peter, I want you to feed my flock. I want you to feed my family. I want you to feed the body and that's what changes our position 
in Christ, as we invest ourselves in redeeming the fallen. We not only become redeemed, <laughs> we become a channel for others to receive the redemption of the Father. Let's take one last one. Jesus instructed and empowered. During these 40 days, between the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus, one of the biggest things Jesus did, he instructed people and he empowered people. He instructed and empowered. In Luke 24, it says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Just like God sent me into the world, I'm sending you as my disciples into the world. Jesus instructed and empowered. It's interesting in the um, grave scene, when they go in and look at the place where Jesus had been laid, they make a point of saying, the scripture writer makes a point of saying that the gravestone, the grave clothes that were around the head of Jesus were folded up. And I read the other day about the custom of the Jewish people when they sat around and, and, and had table together. When the leader was going to go and come back, he would fold up his napkin and lay it on his plate. And everybody knew that he was gone away for a moment but he would be back for the rest of the meal. If he was done, the host would just put the, put the uh, napkin down. It wasn't folded. And it, it seems as if that whole picture at the tomb is to remind everybody he's not done. Whether you saw him in his resurrected form or like we, not He's coming back. That's the instruction and his empowerment that is ours. Some of you have done this before. You've done a, an epitaph exercise where you've tried to write in a small group or, or on your own, what do you want to be known for when you're done with your life? What would we want put on your tomb? You ever done that? Raise your hand if you've done that before. Have you thought about that? Anybody? It's a really powerful exercise. What do you want to be known for when you're gone? Now's the time you're building. And Jesus, he wanted to be known as the Savior, as the Lord. He said, I've come to seek and to save the lost. I mean, that's, that's what was on Jesus' tomb, to seek and to save the lost, <laughs> at least figuratively. Wouldn't we want that on ours? To seek and to save. Not in a Savior's way, but using his love to reach out to others. What were Jesus' parting words? You remember this, right? Therefore, go and make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Whether it's the resurrection where we focus on our, our faith or the commission where we say we're sent like he was sent. We're to evangelize and, and share with the world. We're to be those who are saved and sent. That's the body of Christ. We're saved but we're not just saved, we're sent. He gives us a commission like he was given. We're called with a purpose. The reason you're still on the planet, the reason you're still here, is God's not done with you yet. He has a job for you to do, and it's to reach others. Saved and sent. That's our, that's our um, position. While he was blessing them, he left and he was taken up to heaven. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Let's bow in prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us these examples of what Jesus did following the resurrection. Lord, we pray that the body of Christ would not miss a, a, a thing there. Instead, we would follow the pattern that Jesus established. 
Heavenly Father, we pray that we would be building community like you've called us to build community, that we would show up for one another. We pray that you would allow us to heal the brokenhearted. You would allow us to be, take part in lifting up those that have fallen, redeeming them to you. And Father, that you would give us a chance to be instructive and empowered with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for calling us to that today. Thank you for being in our midst, even as we worship today. We tell you again, Lord, we love you and we honor you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.